Well, howdy YouTube family. It is Bolt CRNA coming to you again with another day's topic. Today, I wanna to talk to you guys about three simple steps on successful intubation. These are some just kind of like really core value ideas and concepts for how to go through a successful intubation with a patient. I've seen this come up more and more often here lately, especially as I've been training first rotation uh, nurse anesthesia residents. It's a, a hard skill. It's a skill that you get very good at as a CRNA, but you definitely don't start off good at. Nobody starts off amazing at this. And we're gonna reflect back on some core ideas and concepts that's gonna make you a good person for intubation. Let's get into it. So the first thing you need to be doing, number one, is doing a very thorough pre-op assessment of your patients. You need to be in there really checking out thyromental distance. You need to be looking at the malum potty and, and when they open their mouth, make them open. I'll, I'll show you. You'll ask them to open a malum potty score is like this. You're going to say, please open your mouth as wide as you can. Stick your tongue out and don't say ah. A close up intimate view of the back of my mouth with my coffee tongue in there for you. Um, Patients are very shy about this sometimes. They'll, they'll go uh, 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 like that or that, they'll do all kinds of weird stuff. And I'm like, no, I want you to open your mouth as wide as it possibly can. I want to see the very back. I want to see down your throat if you can let me. And so some of them will finally open up. But once they do open up, and I'll insert a picture here of the different malum potty classifications of what you may see. These are going to give you an idea of Maybe is this person, it's not a perfect science, but it will give you a little bit of an idea of like how difficult this patient may be to intubate. It's just one of our assessment methods, but it's one that you need to be doing. You need to be looking and seeing. If it's a malum potty four, they're probably gonna be tricky. There's, they're, for some reason, all you're seeing is mostly tongue in their mouth. So either they've got a small mouth opening or something's going on that they've got a massive tongue that's gonna make things complicated to intubate. So if they've got a, if like me, they've got like a malum potty one and you can see almost down to their trachea when they open their mouth, they're probably going to be good. Like there's not, you're probably not going to run into too much trouble. I'm not saying you can't run into trouble, but it's a decent indicator. So do a thorough assessment in pre-op. The malum potty is one. Another one is the thyromental distance. You want to look, you want to look between the chin and the thyroid cartilage and see how long it is. Mine is pretty solid. Mine is like a good mid-range, almost longer really, kind of a longer ending uh, thyromental distance than some. But if I had, say I had like a very short chin that was way back here, and I just had a thyromental distance from here to here, then you would be concerned. That's gonna be indication of like, oh, this person's got a small little mandible. It's, you know, way back here. They've got a barely any thyromental distance. They've got um, probably gonna be an extremely anterior looking airway. It's gonna be difficult. So that's a good indicator for a difficult intubation as well. So you wanna look at thyromental distance. Another important assessment is the width of their mouth. So some people literally, they have mouths that are just like this. They open up, that's like all they're gonna give you. So you're thinking that's gonna be almost impossible to get a blade and a tube through and get around the tongue. Like this person's mouth is this big and, uh, and that's gonna be very complicated. So, and then other people, you know, myself have big wide mouths. So it's like, okay, I've got enough space. Like I can move this tongue and this jaw and I can get in there and see stuff. So you wanna look at the mouth size. The ability to bite the upper lip. That shows you the flexibility of the mandible, the lower jaw. Like if I had some kind of surgery or something or some kind of malformation where I can't move my jaw forward much and it's kind of locked in place, it's gonna be hard to intubate me. So that's another idea of, of something you can look at in pre-op. And the other thing to do is assess the teeth. Ask them, I always tell people, smile. And people are super shy, especially if they have dentition they're not proud of. They'll do this. Oh. They will not smile for you. Like they don't want you to see their teeth. And I have to say like, open your mouth up and smile wide. Show me everything you got. Because I want to see that if you've got like 
teeth that are, um, well, you know, like buck teeth, essentially, that are ex protruding out of your mouth, that's gonna be a problem. It's gonna be difficult to get my blade around those teeth. If you're missing a bunch of teeth, I need to document that and chart. Another concept is like, what if your teeth are coming loose? What if you have like a half in tooth or something? I need to know that because I need to be careful of that. What if you have an implanted bridge? That's special hardware that I need to be careful to be, you know, maneuvering around. I don't want to try and instrument the airway in a way that could damage any kind of special teeth or veneers or anything you have in there. So that's why when anesthesia asks you like, open your mouth, let me see all your teeth, tell me everything you got implanted, all that stuff. It seems weird and overly invasive. All the times patients will ask me like, why are you asking that? That's strange to me, that's why. So now you've done a thorough pre-op assessment of the airway. You've decided, okay, this patient looks like they're gonna be pretty easy, not too much trouble going on, shouldn't, shouldn't have any worry of teeth coming out or anything like that. Good, now you go to your OR, you need to assemble your supplies. You need to decide, do I wanna use a Mac blade for this person, a Miller blade? Do I need to use a McGrath video learn to scope? Do I wanna use a glide scope? Does this need to be a fiber optic intubation? Do I expect to need a bougie? Like a bougie should always be nearby in the OR anyway, but you wanna check and see, do I have a bougie in case I run into trouble? You know, and I need to use a bougie to help me style at someone. You want your equipment and your backup equipment either in the OR with you or right outside the OR and easily grabbable. You don't wanna get into a situation where you're already induce the patient, you're trying to get a view with your intubation, you're realizing you're struggling and you don't have the equipment you need to make it successfully uh, to intubate this patient. That's terrible, negligent anesthetic care. Don't do that. So assemble all of your drugs and your supplies at that point. Third tip is go slow in the beginning. When, you are, when you're a new rotation student, when you're a new trainee, resident, physician resident, or nurse anesthesia resident, and you're getting used to intubating, don't go in there like wild with your blade and just start like, you know, hammering down with the ET tube and, you know, poking at stuff and all that. Go slow, not so slow that your patient's desaturating at this point and you're in an airway emergency, but you know, go at a pace where you're scissoring properly with the mouth, you're not cracking the jaw and you're not like grabbing the teeth and doing crazy stuff. Go slow and careful. Make sure you're not pinning the lip against the teeth and like breaking the lip all the time. And, and go in there, get a good view, slowly advance the blade so that you're not causing trauma back there. Get in there and use your view. If you're using the Mac blade, you know, you hook it into the molecular. If you're using the Miller blade, you pin the epiglottis with it and you lift up and then get your view. And be vocal about this. So when you're getting in there and you're finding your view, you wanna say, cause I can't see what you're seeing. Uh, you're the only one that can really see that. So for me to understand what you're doing and what's happening back there, you need to be telling me like, okay, I see the vallecula now. I'm in the vallecula, I'm lifting up. I see the epiglottis, the epiglottis is up. Okay, I have a grade two view. So grade two, that means a Cormac Lehane score. These are your grades, grades one, two, three, and four of your views, similar to the mountain potty with the airway assessment. This is your assessment of the glottic opening. So this is what you're looking at when you're trying to intubate, when you're looking back at the trachea before you place your endotracheal tube. So I'll show a picture here of what the different grading scores mean of the Cormac Lehane score. If you tell me you uh, see a grade one view, then that lets me know clearly you have a very good clear opening, you're confident about it, it looks good, no problems, you're going in, you're intubating, good. You tell me you have a grade three view, now I have concerns. Like either you're not instrumenting the airway very well, or this patient is suddenly a difficult intubation that we didn't anticipate and we need to be thinking about secondary equipment we need to be using. Do we need to use a bougie? Do I need to grab the glide scope? You know, do we want to use a McGrath? Uh, are you just not you know, holding your Mac blade well? Do we need to switch to the Miller blade? So always be vocal about what you're doing, especially in the beginning of your training when, I, when I'm not sure how comfortable and competent an intubation you are, it's important to kind of let me know like, hey, this is what I'm seeing, this is what's going on. Now, if you're in your like last year of training and you've intubated hundreds of times, I don't necessarily need to hear you go through everything verbally what you're doing because I expect at this point you can successfully intubate 90% of your patients without my help. You know, I'm just in there as backup watching you do it. So in that case, it's a little different. But in your first probably year of training, 
I would say you really need to be very vocal about what you're seeing and what's going on. That way I can intervene. If something's wrong, if something's happening and you're not seeing something well or something's you know going wrong back there, I need to hear it so that I can go grab the equi appropriate equipment and I can help you. And my last tip for new people who are training on intubation is speak up and be just very open and honest when you need help. If you're looking at something and we've and, and you said, hey, I've got a grade three or four view and I, I'm not getting it, or I hand you the bougie and I say, okay, well, advance the bougie and you're not getting it with the bougie either, but you don't want to tell me that you're not getting it with the bougie because you don't want to admit defeat or you feel like it's going to make you a failure or you get this tunnel vision and you're like, well, I'm going to get it eventually. I'm just going to keep working at it. I'm going to keep trying. Don't do that. If you've tried something once or twice and you're still not getting it in your first year or so of training and you're struggling, don't keep just stabbing at things and trying harder and harder to get it. What you will cause to happen is the patient at this point is not getting oxygen. Their oxygen levels will start to drop. You'll also be causing trauma in the airway from all of this instrumentation of the you know, Mac blade, then your Miller blade, now you're trying to bougie and you're stabbing into the esophagus and you're having all this trouble. What you're going to have happen is the secretions, the, the patient's mouth will have already been starting to an overdrive, submit, you know, start secreting thick, gooey saliva that will start dripping back to the back of the throat. You're going to start having a little bit of some mucous membranes bleeding a little bit from the trauma. You're going to mix that with your saliva. It's going to be this foamy, messy thing that occludes your airway. You're not going to be able to see well. It might even start moving down into the trachea and maybe even causing a laryngospasm. Now, there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong and I'll just tell you in anesthesia, if you, if you mess around too long in the intubation process, it's like a snowball effect and things start to snowball and the airway starts getting inflamed, it starts swelling, the tongue will, can start to get a little swollen and swell. Everything starts to just get worse. The patient will start to wake up from the propofol and they'll start to maybe buck or move and stuff. The heart rate will go up. Things go badly quickly. So as a trainee, if you're in there and you're trying something and you're not getting it and you're not getting it a third time, don't keep trying. Immediately tell me, hey, I don't feel good. Like I'm not getting this. Do you want to step in? And then I'm going to step in. Uh, it's already going to be trickier for me to get it now because there's been some trauma and some other issues, but I'm going to be able to get it for you probably. But don't wait until, and don't try and like be tough and make sure you get it to the point that I have to like push you out of the way and say, get, you know, move. This is becoming an emergency now. And, uh, and it becomes that kind of situation. Then you're gonna feel really terrible and, it's, and it doesn't look good on you as a clinician. So please, if you're struggling and you know you are and things are not going downhill, step out of the way, say, I'm, you know, please take over. And then the, you know, the physician anesthesiologist or the CRNA will take over and we will you know, fix the situation for you. But it's important to know when it's time to say, all right, I'm, I'm good, I tried this once or twice, I'm not getting it. I'm going to step aside. Well, all right, guys, those are my five tips for what you can do as a new trainee learning on intubation and learning in anesthesia how to do this really important and but also critical skill. Uh, and that can, you know, be something that becomes very routine to us. We do it all day, all the time, and we don't really think about it that much as you go forward and have years of experience. You just naturally do all these things I just mentioned. You kind of just do it naturally and easily and usually quickly. So it will come to you with time, but in the beginning, it definitely isn't something natural to you. It's something you have to learn. It's a hard skill and it's important to know when to say like, hey, I'm not getting it. Somebody else step in. And, uh, and I think you'll do well. If you, if you kind of stick to these five tips here, I think you're going to do pretty well and it's not going to be as stressful or traumatic for you to, to learn and grow in this role. I want to hear from you guys down below how you learned in anesthesia and intubation. Did you do anything, any special tips that I didn't mention here that really helped you out and feel more confident and comfortable intubating and training and learning in this skill? I mean, a lot of people intubate, you know, paramedics, uh, EMTs, uh, who else? A respiratory therapist, intensivists, ER physicians. There's, there's a handful, pulmonologists. There's a handful of people out there who also intubate besides just anesthesia. So you guys let me know too, like in your training, what did you guys do to make sure you were successful? Also go follow me over on TikTok. I'm over there. It's BoltCRNA, goofy, funny, short videos. Follow me on Instagram, BoltCRNA over there. 
Join the memberships over here. We've got live chats every month, behind the scenes videos. I do one-on-one -on -one mock interviews with you guys. I offer a 26 page study guide to help you get into CRNA school. It's a great thing. I love connecting with you guys over there. So follow me over there. Join up on the memberships here on YouTube. And that is Bolt Out.